A very, very good evening to you all. A very, very good evening to all dear children. There is a well-known saying in the English language which warns people of the dangers of superficial appearances. All that glitters is not gold. Now, I'm afraid to tell you that I believe in completely the opposite. For me, all that glitters is gold. I simply love metals. Now, I'm very, very fortunate, and I've discovered that I'm not the only one who has this very strong idea. Could we have the first slide, please? You will see there the slide of two very, very distinguished people. They were Charles Rolls and Henry Royce. They're the people who founded the Rolls-Royce Motor Car Company. One was a brilliant engineer. The other was an obsessive driver of motor cars and a pilot as well. And this is looking back at the beginning of the 20th century when aeroplanes and cars were just starting to be driven. Now... I said I just love the way metals shine. I have brought on with me, of course, here, as I'm sure most of you will recognize, is part of a Rolls-Royce motor car. This, of course, uh, for me, this is shiny, it's strong, it's wonderful. I'm going to ask Andres, my good friend, to, and who's helping me this evening, to kindly take it away and place it in front while I continue with my discourse on metals. So what sort of things do we know about? Well, I told you they're shiny. Look at this magnificent magnificent, magnificent cocktail set. This comes from India. India is one of the countries with the most ancient traditions in metal craft. And you see here, magnificently made, strong, beautifully usable as well. This is um, one of the shininess. That's one of the properties, the shininess. This beautiful silver trumpet here, very shiny. Not only here we have a little bit of a, a tube, you see, like this. Once again, shiny copper. I personally am enormously drawn. Oh, another beautiful, this, I always think this is gold. You see, it's not, it's brass, but by gum, I like it. And I have it just because I like looking at it. Now, metals are all so strong. Here we have a model. This is obviously a model of the famous Eiffel Tower in, in Paris. And this is made of wrought iron, strong. Metals, of course, are hard. And they're, they're, they're hard, you know that, you can, uh, etc. And the next thing, metals are sonorous when struck. That means that if you make an appropriate shape and uh, you know, give it a whack, then it makes a ringing sound like that. Not only are they sonorous when struck, but they can make a very beautiful sound when you blow through them. So I'll just try and play a few notes on this trumpet now. And you see it's a sound, and you see it's a sound which is very beautiful, and it's a sort of a sound that you wouldn't get if the trumpet was made of wood or of some other material, you see, because it has this special metallic ring to it. So that's another property. Metals also are very good conductors of electricity. They can, and here you see, I have a battery here, a car battery, which all cars have, of course, and it is very heavy, it's made of lead. And this was a very, the, the, the interesting thing about this, a battery like this, the first battery of this type, a reversible battery, and that means you can recharge it, I meant a rechargeable battery, was uh, invented by the French chemist Gaston Planté. Could we have the next slide, please? There you are, there's Gaston Planté. He invented this in 1859. And this is still the main type of car battery which is being used today. Batteries, electric cells, were invented by Volta. Volts, we measure our electric potential in volts. Alessandro Volta was the Italian who first invented um, batteries or electric cells in the year 1800. But the problem, they got used up, so people then had to buy another one or get another one. This 
is rechargeable, pure genius. Now, not only is this electri can electricity be made from this, but we can make use of the electricity. The wire cables which I have here, you see, are ductile. That means you can, inside it's copper, of course. Inside it's a copper cable. And not only does it make electricity, but we can actually make it do some useful work. Now, here you see I have an electric motor. This is a motor car starter motor, and I'm going to set it into motion. I'm going to connect it. What I'd like you to look at, you see, when you start a motor car, you twiddle the, the key and boom, boom, the car goes off. But what actually happens? There is always an electric motor that gets it going. And please watch this spindle, this bit here, that will actually move when I connect the thing. So please watch. Here's our electric motor. There it is. And watch what happens to that spindle. Can you see it moving up and down the axis? Now, it moves up and down the axis because this is done by centripetal force, and it engages, these gears engage into the flywheel, and then it disengages once the car gets going. Easy to demonstrate here, not very easy to understand or indeed to know about. Now, this, of course, Michael Faraday, can I have the next person? Michael Faraday, of course, was the person who invented the electric motor in, I think it was 1821, and this, of course, one of the most greatest inventions of all time. He was also, he loved metals as well. And many of his great works were concerned with metals. He studied iron, the, the metallurgy of iron. For two years, he did study nothing but iron. And eventually, this led to the discovery of the electric motor. Now, another property of metals is that many of them have a very high density. That means they weigh a large amount for a given volume. And I wanted to just show you an application of um, this, uh, the high density, with a very simple device like this, which is called a gyroscope. Now, a gyroscope is a device which has an axle, and on the axle there is a wheel, but the wheel has a high density. It's made of metal, especially the rim. It's heavy. And when you make it spin very fast, it spins so fast that it can actually withstand gravity, it can almost seem to defy gravity. Now, what I've, I've got a team here of helpers who are going to start up one of these quickly and, start, and put it on top of the Eiffel Tower. The point is, I myself, I'm, I'm so nervous of doing this that I've actually got a few friends to help me. So they're going to uh, spin it and watch how once it's spinning, and they'll all try one because it's so difficult that we don't always know which one will work. But Please, these are two of my children are here. This is Oscar and Clara. There we have Aiden, who's a friend, and the family friend, Nuron, there. And you see, just look at that. Start up the other ones. Let's have them. Let's have a whole party of, of, um, of gyroscopes. Now, you see, it appears to defy gravity. How does it work? It's very difficult to explain. Watch out. It doesn't fall off, Oscar. It's about to come down. Tumbling down. There you are. Look at these beautiful gyroscopes spinning along. Now, do you know where this is used here? children. These are used in aeroplane navigation systems. The reason why aeroplanes, thank you, brilliant. So there we are. We have a whole, a large number of gyroscopes. They seem to create their own gravitational field. How they work, you know, I asked lots of friends, experts, engineers. They all said, do you know what? They puzzle, they scratch, they search, and they said it's very, very difficult to understand. Apparently, the two clever scientific words that are used are angular momentum. Gyroscopes have a high angular momentum. What that means, as they're moving rapidly, it's very difficult to push it off its, um, off its course of motion. Now, I want to, so I've introduced you some properties, some basic physical properties of metals. That means that we haven't changed the metals. They remain exactly the same. But people, how long have we been using metals for? And people have often asked the question, where do metals come from? You see, lots of people have had lots of ideas. Today, for instance, we know that we get the metals from ores which are found in the ground. But in days of time, metals have been known for, I said, say, say 10,000, 10, 20,000 years. People used to have a, a strange ideas which seem to us. Please, can I have the next slide? And you see here, this is there were seven metals known in the ancient times. They were gold, silver, copper, mercury, tin, iron, and lead. 
And people said, well, where do these metals come from? And there was a popular theory that metals were born from gold. That gold, here you see the king, uh, uh, the king there, and the king has got six crowns. And each of those crowns, and there are numbers, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, those represent the, the gold is metal number one, and the other six metals are born from gold. Now, that's, of course, to us today, that's difficult to understand. It looks like nonsense. But people, you see, they had to to have some sort of idea, and this was an idea which I said was presented in 1599, and that's the sort of way pe they believed that metals were alive, that they grow, they grew in the bowels of the earth. Enough then on the historical background, I now wanted to turn to just so metals are strong, they per permanent, they, they, you know, they use, they have masses of applications. I have a book here, The Story of the Chemical Elements. It's written by Patterson Muir, who is um, a brilliant professor of chemistry, and it was published in 1901. There we are, M. M. Patterson Muir, London, George Nunes, etc. 1901. Now, on page, on page um, 17, about metals, we read something which I personally found very, very surprising. And it says here, um, some metals disappear in acrid liquids. Disappear? What do you mean? A metal, something as solid as this, you can actually make it disappear? That's exactly what it does mean. And here you see we are entering into a new realm of science, the science of chemistry, because metals can undergo certain processes during which they are changed completely into different substances. They, use, they lose their metallicness, they lose their luster, and they become quite, quite different. And I am going to demonstrate to you in the next few minutes the how we can actually disappear some metals using Moyer's language into acrid liquids, which today we can call acids. Now, I'm going to start off with this beautiful copper tube here, which looks about as permanent, as strong, and you know we use these in central heating systems. Copper is also a very good conductor of heat, brilliant conductor of heat and electricity. I'm going to make it disappear now by placing it. Um, have we got a piece of cotton wool? Um, and we just seem to a strip of cotton wool to, to block off the top. But we'll. I'll put it in now. Now I have to do this reaction for five minutes. Are we there, Andres? A piece of cotton wool. This is just to prevent because you'll be quite shocked at what you're going to see. In. Thank you very much indeed. In this beaker here, I have. 20, I have 30 milliliters of concentrated nitric acid. It's in this brown bottle here. By gum, this is an acrid liquid. I now stand my tube in there, and at the same time, I'm going to start my stop clock. Thank you very much indeed. Now, while I'm doing this, while this reaction is now proceeding, and it's going to take five minutes at least, and I'm going to measure it with a clock, you're going to see how this metal is starting to disappear. We're certainly not going to disappear the whole copper tube, but we will disappear a significant part of it, and you're going to see some pretty interesting effects, and we'll investigate those. But Another metal I wanted to show you and to introduce you to is the metal magnesium. Magnesium, believe it or not, was first prepared once again in this building by the great chemist and scientist Humphrey Davy. There we are. Humphrey Davy was the first person to prepare magnesium. Could we just show the reel of magnesium ribbon and the, and the, and the, the um, pencil sharpener? Thank you very much, Andres. You see, this is a pencil sharpener made of magnesium. So this is a metal which is is light, which is strong and eminently suitable for making pencil sharpeners, among many other other products. And this is the way we get magnesium in schools. It comes in the form of a magnesium ribbon. Now, I'm going to show you now how we can make a small piece of magnesium ribbon disappear completely into some dilute sulfuric acid. So please watch carefully. There goes my acid in there. I'm now going to, I'm now going to pop in my piece of magnesium. Et voila! And here you see it's bubbling away. The metal is bubbling away, and while it's bubbling away, there is a little bit of uh, steam coming off, some sort of effort, uh, and uh, some sort of vapor you see is coming off, a uh, gas in fact, and it is getting smaller and smaller. I'm just checking my clock. Uh, we've still got, we've had the one, we're, we're doing fine.
So we're, we're get to coming up to two minutes there. And please, in the meantime, observe what's happening. There are brown fumes beginning to accumulate in our bell jar here. So the magnesium, as I swirl it around, is getting smaller and smaller. So the question which I am asking now is what has it changed into? It disappears, but it can't have disappeared altogether. It's gone into that liquid in there, the acrid liquid, which we call sulfuric acid. And as I see, I'm continuing to swirl it around. It's getting smaller and smaller in its dimension there. And it's almost stopped bubbling almost stopped bubbling, and there it is, you see, just the last little fragment there disappearing completely. Now what I'm going to do is to put this to one side. Very shortly, I'm just making sure the last little bit disappears, so you will all agree with me that there was magnesium there a couple of minutes ago, and now there is no. The metal has been and gone. But what has it changed into? That's what I'm going to ask Andres to do during the next few minutes, where he will conduct a larger experiment. Andres, could you just take me through? What have we got in the bottom of that flask? Sulfuric acid. So this is actually a larger version of the experiment, but in this experiment, we're going to collect the gas. Andres will be collecting the gas, and while he's collecting the gas, so could you please start that off there, Andres? While Andres is collecting the gas, I will then, um, I will then return to, to here, and then we're going to in investigate what the liquid is in there. Now, you see, so here is the copper. It is turning, it is clearly doing something very, very vigorous indeed, and these brown fumes, these are fumes of a gas, which is is called nitrogen dioxide. Nitric acid frequently produces nitrogen dioxide in reactions with metals, and this gas is quite toxic. It's a poisonous gas. However, I've put a cotton wool plug in there, and the other thing I have to tell you, it's, thank you very much indeed. The other thing I have to tell you is that this is nowhere near as poisonous as a whole number of other gases. The reason why I'm telling you that is because during this experiment, a certain amount of this this will be released and from the, um, from the jar underneath as I lift my thing off, so my bell jar off. This is, by the way, called the bell jar, and it really does make a beautiful ringing sound when it's suspended. Now, we're coming up to 4 minutes 48, so I'm timing it another few seconds, and then I shall halt the reaction. The five minutes, by the way, it's not critical. It's an approximate time, because during this time, I know that this will have made an amount which is. So we've just gone over five minutes now. So I'm now going to take out my copper tube. Please watch carefully. As I take it out, I'm going to put my cork in the top. And you'll notice the copper tube has turned to a remarkable blue color at the bottom, you see. So the copper, it hasn't disappeared, it's changed. Actually, it has disappeared a bit off the bottom there. So I am now going to place my tube here on my piece of cloth, you see, which will, which, which will protect our bench. And the, the honest truth is, these are very beautiful tiny crystals which we've made there. But we'll inspect those later on. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to to now inspect the product of what that acid has made when it's reacted with the copper. So, Andres, now let me just think. I've got to think through carefully. Please allow me. I have to just uh, make sure that everything is done with safety. What I'm going to tell you all now is when Andres lifts the bell jar, he'll be tilting at an angle. I will then take the liquid out, and then he will immediately, obviously, put the bell jar back. During that time, some nitrogen dioxide, which has been released here, will actually come out, and it will spread over here. Now, in order to minimize the effect, as I say, it's not dangerous in any way. I do this all the time. I've been doing it for 60 years, in fact. Now, it's not dangerous, but it does. I'm going to open a bottle of ammonia there, because ammonia is a liquid which neutralizes, and actually it has quite a pleasant smell when it's in very, very dilute amounts. So, Andres, can I ask you, therefore, to lean this backwards as, as far as you can? Yep, yep, ready? Thank you very much indeed. And now back again. And there you see, there's your cloud of nitrogen dioxide, you see, and that will very shortly be dispersed in a very, very harmful, harmless manner, should I say. Ha-ha! <laughs> yes! 
And you see, I'm still. And can you see that white smoke, dear children? This white smoke is the product of the reaction of ammonia with this gas. It's totally and utterly harmless. It's just ammonium nitrate. Now, let's then return to the essence of the matter. You see this liquid? It has a very, very dark blue-green color. I am now going to show you some remarkable chemical changes with this. I'm going to, first of all, pour some water in to um, approximately double the volume. And I hope you can all see, first thing is, we have a beautiful blue color has appeared. Now that blue color, you see, is, called, is caused by all copper compounds when they're dissolved in water. It's called the copper tetraquo complex ion. You don't have to remember these, just remember the colors are blue. I am now going to pour in, pour in um, certain, I'm going to divide this solution into four portions. Four portions, you see, like this. And to each portion, I am going to add a different liquid. Or I'm going to factor the first one. I'm going to add the same liquid, but I'm going to add the liquids in different quantities. So I'm going to start off here. This is, as I repeat, quite a tricky procedure. I have my blue solution, and I'm going to be adding ammonia solution. This is concentrated ammonia, has a very, very strong smell, but I have to say it is quite harmless if you hold it at arm's length. I'm now going to add it, and I'm going to be stirring vigorously. And please watch to see any color change. This is the important bit. We're looking at colors, color changes, to show us that's a chemical reaction. And there you see, it has gone to a beautiful green color. Can you all see that? That's a beautiful green, you see. And we say, we call this, that that's obviously something to do with copper. If I now take some more um, ammonia solution and add it in and swirl vigorously. Then we'll get the green color in a minute, obviously. We're going to hopefully get the green color. And once we've got the green, we carry on adding more ammonia solution. Now, this is when it gets interesting. There's our green, you see. There's our green. But now as I add more, you'll notice it starts to turn milky. You'll notice a milkiness appearing. It is now no longer a clear liquid. It is now a milky liquid. There's a solid suspended in there. And gradually, the yellow, the green color will disappear, and it will be replaced by a pale blue color. And that pale blue color, dear children, is what we call copper hydroxide. It's a precipitate. It's a solid in there, and it's floating around and causing the milkiness to appear in there. So we move that there. And the next one, we simply add a slightly larger amount of ammonia all in one go for yet another extraordinary color change. And there it is. We now have a beautiful deep blue color. And this is called the copper tetramine complex ion. So what we've now got, what we've now got is a remarkable series of colors just produced from one element, one metal, and that is copper. Thank you very much. And though I wanted to show you, I'm going to now close my ammonia, by the way, because um, the smell is, it's, it's quite strong, uh, but it's nevertheless not doing me any damage at the moment. So we close the bottle. And what I'm now going to do, you see, is show you yet another experiment. So we have, here was a light blue here, green, milky blue here, and intense blue here. Now I'm going to add some water. I'm going to add some water to my copper sulfate. So this is copper nitrate, rather, because the chemical name for the metal having reacted with nitric acid is copper nitrate. There it is, the beautiful blue color, you see. And I am now going to add to this some potassium iodide solution. Now, this is something quite different, and the color changes will also be quite different. So please watch carefully. And you see, it's gone to a sort of a yellow color. And as we continue, it seems to be going to a sort of an olive green color. And as we continue to add, it starts to go murky. And it's the murkiness which we're interested in this particular reaction. I'm pouring in quite a large amount, you see. And you see, Inside, there is a, clearly a brown color there, but there is also a milkiness of some sort. Now, in chemistry, we can separate. I'm not sure what that milkiness is, or if I'm not sure, we can separate it by the process of filtration. I am now going to pour my solution in here, which has clearly got some milkiness in it, into my flask, which is fitted with a funnel, which is fitted with a filter paper. And you'll notice what's coming through is a 
beautiful, clear liquid there, which has a sort of a yellowy brown appearance. Now, that, dear children, has got nothing to do with copper. This, in fact, has been produced from the potassium iodide solution, and it is, in fact, the element iodine. What I'm going to do now, and Andres is going to pour off a tiny bit from there, uh, is something different. Now, what I have to also tell you about is, in that case, what's happened to the copper. And I have to tell you that in this particular case, uh, Andres is now di diluting this. Thank you very much. That's brilliant, Andres. Now, what I'm telling you now is the copper in this particular reaction with potassium iodide has changed its oxidation state. It's changed its combining power. You see here, we have copper ions, Cu2+. Here, we have cuprous iodide, C-U-I. And this is a remarkable type of a chemical reaction which is typical of copper, the metal copper, and a whole bunch of other metals which I'll tell you about shortly. Now, while we're waiting for this to filter, and some of you will shortly be able to see that what's left on the filter paper has a white color, because that's, no, that's copper, it's a copper compound, but it's no longer blue. It's no longer bluey green, it is white. And that is because the copper has now been converted to a different type of copper with combining power, which is different. We say the oxidation state has changed from plus two to plus one. And now, let's have a look at our iodine, you see, because frequently people may have a reaction like this. And, oh, by the way, Andres, would you be able to get rid of the, um, the nitro? We're going to now show you how to, you see, these are the toxic fumes, etc. Uh, Andres is going to spray into there um, some 10% um, ammonia solution. It's a much diluted version of this, but watch the beautiful white smoke which is produced when we spray into it some, and that, you see, is what it's doing. It's neutralizing the acidic nitrogen dioxide dioxide, and it's simply leaving behind relatively harmless ammonium nitrate. So thank you very much, Andres, that's perfect. So we now, see, when we clear this away, as we will do, there will be no danger of, uh, say, poisoning by nitrogen dioxide. Um, and, and, and ammonium nitrate is not toxic. Yeah, we can leave, uh, yeah, just we're going to leave it there, or whatever you like. Now, at this stage, what I wanted to do is to just show you, you see that a brown liquid like this, you could say, oh, what could it be? There are quite a few substances which this could be, but there's one definitive way of proving that it's iodine, and that is to add an organic solvent. I'm now going to add here some heptane, which is an organic solvent, it's a hydrocarbon, and I'm going to show you that when we shake up this iodine with the heptane, we then get a most beautiful color form. And this beautiful color is here. It's a sort of a lilac, you see, and it's a pink color. And this, you see, is due to the formation of iodine in two different states in when it's dissolved. In water, when it's dissolved, it has a yellowy brown color, but in many organic solvents, it has a pink color. And that's the way we use to prove definitively that that brown color is due to iodine. Well, obviously, in this case, it has to be because we start with potassium iodide here in the first place. You may see at the bottom of our flask now, there is a white, a white uh, suspension or a white precipitate, and indeed, we are filtering this off here now. We'll leave that alone now and come back to our magnesium experiment. So, Andres, who's disappeared at the moment, is going to show you now, he has collected three gas jars. Could we set off the, the, the gas? When any metal reacts with an acid and forms a gas which has no color, it forms hydrogen. In this particular case, um, hydrogen gas has been produced. I am going to take this, because this is what's left from the magnesium reacting with... So, so Andres, could you just show everyone um, just the... Hind could we have the lights down for this? Then the children will see the flame a little bit better as the hydrogen burns. Thank you very much indeed. That's perfect. Absolutely brilliant. So you see, you see, it burns with a dull thud. That's pure hydrogen burning in air. And we, the three of them will all do the same thing. And there is the second one. And finally, 
are there. And so you see, that's hydrogen. Notice, by the way, lights back on. Can you see they've all steamed up a bit? And the reason why they've steamed up is because when hydrogen burns, it combines with oxygen in the air to make water. That's why it's called hydrogen. Hydrogen, the word means hydra and genesis. Those are the two words which it comes from in ancient Greek. Hydra meaning water and genesis to be born. So as it burns, it makes water. 2H2 plus O2 makes 2H2O. That's the chemical equation. But now let's see what's happened to our magnesium. You see, we have a liquid in here with no magnesium in it. And we can demonstrate what has happened by doing a very, very simple test to see if we can identify the magnesium in some sort of way. So we've got our liquid here. And for comparison, I have now got some dilute sulfuric acid, which is what we started with. So on my left, there is dilute sulfuric acid. And on my right, there is the sulfuric acid once it has reacted with the magnesium. And uh, we can very quickly show you what we've made. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, by adding some dilute sodium hydroxide. If I pour some sodium hydroxide here, then you will notice into the sulfuric acid, you'll notice absolutely nothing happens. It's reacted an acid and an alkali making salt plus water. But when we add it here where the magnesium was, Please watch carefully what happens now. And now you see the appearance of a white milkiness. Now that white milkiness in here is called magnesium hydroxide. And believe it or not, it's exactly the same substance which is in milk of magnesia, which is used to treat antacid. So if it's an antacid, if you have too much acidity, you don't feel too well, you actually take this substance here. Magnesium compounds are generally very friendly to our living systems and to, to bodies and so forth, and they can be used in bath salts and, and as, as you see here, as an antacid. Now, I have shown you some examples of re liquids reacting uh, chemically. I am now going to show you a most interesting, dissolving, we've dissolved in acrid liquid. I am now going to show you how we can dissolve a metal in another metal but this is not a chemical reaction. And what I'm going to show you here is a most remarkable effect. Now, in my Petri dish here, uh, have we got our light? Could we have the, um, the camera on, please? Thank you very much. Let's just have a quick, ah, there it is. Can you see it moving around here? That is a little of the liquid metal, mercury. And what I'm going to show you is that mercury is the only metal which is a liquid at room temperature and pressure. And I'm going to take into, into my mercury, I'm going to now place some pure gold. This, dear children, is nothing other than pure 24 karat gold. And I'm going to now place a small quantity, place this gold leaf. I hope you can all see it. There as I wave it around, and I'm going to push it into the mercury. Now, what you're going to see now is a most remarkable effect. It's an effect where the gold appears to disappear completely into the mercury. And if that's what you think has happened to it, you are absolutely right. Because the mercury has now dissolved the gold completely, and it has formed what we call a solution. A solution of one metal in another, and this type of a solution where gold dissolves, or rather a metal dissolves in mercury, and mercury can dissolve many, many by the way, um, many metals, they are called amalgams. A, an amalgam is formed when, one, when a metal dissolves in mercury. Now, that then compl completes our section there on the disappearing of metals. You see, it's almost gone. The mercury isn't 100% pure, but you've seen um, a clear effect there. Now, we've completed the section then on dissolving the metals uh, in, uh, in making them disappear, acrid liquids in mercury. And I've come to the topic of mercury. Mercury is the only liquid, the only metal which is a liquid at room temperature. And here I have some here. It has an extraordinarily high density. This is very, very heavy indeed what I have here. And what I wanted to tell you moreover, that mercury has been known for many thousands of years. For instance, it was made in ancient China, where they used to manufacture mercury by roasting the ore cinnabar. Also, that's mercuric sulfide. Also, mercury was mined extensively in Spain. In Spain, there are huge deposits of mercury 
compounds, and therefore in Spain much mercury was manufactured. Mercury was such an interesting metal that various people thought it must have unusual properties. Now, in the great Islamic world of Islamic science, the great philosophers there, because they had a very, very sophisticated technology and science already a thousand, two thousand years ago, they came up with the theory that all metals are ultimately made from a combination of sulfur and mercury. In different proportions, these two give different different, um, different um, metals. Oh, by the way, I've just noticed the slide is up. Thank you very much indeed. That's the reaction for magnesium and sulfuric acid, having made magnesium sulfate and hydrogen. That's the reaction which we just saw a couple of minutes ago, and I demonstrated the magnesium sulfate by getting the precipitate of magnesium hydroxide with sodium hydroxide. Thank you very much indeed. And now we move on. We move on then to the... Oh, by the way, can we... Just at this point, another, another little pause. What actually are metals? People have sort of wondered. Um, the, as I said, the, the great Islamic um, theory had said that, oh, they're, they're, they're mixtures of, of uh, copper, of, of mercury and sulfur, and depending on the ratio, you get a different metal. Again, that sounds bizarre to us, but there is, there is much sense in that theory too. And people were asking, what sort of a substance is a metal? Well, today we know metals are examples of the most pure, simple building blocks of nature. We call these elements. There are, um, an element is the simplest kind of substance made of one kind of atom. And if we look now at the next slide, it shows you one of the greatest discoveries of the human race. It is the periodic classification of the elements, which was first published in 1869 by the great Russian chemist Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev, and in it, he placed all of the elements. Now, elements are the simplest substances, and they are beautifully lined up, as you see. And if we now actually look at the next slide, you will see that this same table can be roughly classified as follows, in that the majority of the elements, the ones in grey, are in fact metals. So that is remarkable to think of the elementary building blocks in our universe, the majority by far, are metals, and the ones in yellow are non-metals, and the ones in red are the semi-metals. So we will continue our discourse returning to mercury, which is such an unusual metal. And it's a liquid at room temperature, and I'm now going to show you the idea of a liquid metal. We've had solid metals over here. This is a solid. We are now turning to liquid metals in the form of mercury. It's the only metal which is a liquid at room temperature and pressure. Now, what I'm going to show you now is how you can actually freeze mercury into a solid. So we are going to change its state. And indeed, I'm going to show you how we can make a useful tool out of it. And I'm going to show you how we can make a hammer. Here I have, you see, a special mold. Excuse me, it's all falling apart, but that doesn't matter because I'm here to show you. And this is, a, this is the hammer, a handle, and it has a hole through the middle. And this is a mold. This mold here, which is going to be um, held together with our special clamp, I'm going to fill this with mercury. And after that, I'm going to pour around it, I'm going to pour liquid nitrogen. Now, liquid nitrogen is another one of the great triumphs of physics. It was, as I said, it has a very low temperature. I'm not going to go into details, but just to tell you that liquid nitrogen boils at minus 196 degrees centigrade. Now, mercury turns to a solid at minus 39 degrees centigrade. I am now going to very carefully pour in 80 centimeters cubed, approximately, of mercury into our mercury hammer mold. There it is. I'm pouring it very carefully as this. There we are. Et voilà. Now, that's our mercury. As I repeat, it weighs a considerable amount. It has a very, very high density. And I'm now going to carefully pour it via a funnel here into our into our mold for making a hammer. I'm going to turn it from a liquid to a solid, a change of state. I'm carefully pouring it in. I'm sorry you can't see what's inside, but I can tell you it is definitely going in, and I will shortly see a little bit flowing out over the top. Now, Andres, could you kindly give me the liquid nitrogen, please? 
That would be very kind. There it is. It's just poured out. A little bit has come out over the top. That's very kind of you. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to freeze it to a solid. I'm just going to pour that in there. And I'm, now, and I'm going to freeze it to a solid by pouring liquid nitrogen. Now, please watch carefully. As I pour it in, you will see a huge commotion. A huge commotion. And this commotion is caused by the fact that the liquid nitrogen is boiling very, very vigorously. It's boiling away because the mercury in this room is very, very hot indeed. And this will continue to boil away for quite a long while. And while it's boiling away, the, night, the mercury will gradually set to a solid. Now, I am going to leave Andres to continue topping this up. And Andres, could you kindly turn on uh, in a second, in a second, okay? I'm going to leave Andres to continue topping up the, um, the mercury. It will take about five minutes to freeze solid. And I'm now going to turn to the next interesting thing about metals, and that is that you can get metals as a gas. There are three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. So far, I have shown you some solid metals. There they are at the back. I've shown you just one liquid metal, but here, thank you so much, we have metals in the form of a gas. And what that means is that it is a vapor, and it is trapped inside two tubes here. And these, dear, my dear children, these two tubes here are lights, obviously. This is actually, these two lights, I have to tell you, were loaned to me by a very good friend of mine. His name is Charlie, and he's a brilliant pupil of science at Alexandra Park School in North London. Now, Charlie's passionately interested in science, and he, as a hobby, he collects these lights. And I can tell you that they are not very expensive for those who are interested. And I think once I've told you a few more things about these lights, I've got a feeling that some of you might take up this hobby. Now, you see, you look at the color, you look at the color here, and you notice it's white, and this one is red. This one, I'll tell you, is an orange color. This, you see, is the metal sodium. The metal sodium, which is in the form of a vapor, and it's got a very, very high electric discharge pass, a high voltage through it, and it's turning it into a vapor, and the vapor is glowing with this bright orange glow. Here, on the other hand, we have the vapor of the metal mercury, this one which I have here. And if I say to you, then this is the, um, the this, this, um, these colors are um, orange and white, you will say, yes, of course, that's what we can see. However, scientists have devised a very, very special way of looking at this light in a different way. And I have here four special, special tools, which I'm going to invite four children to come. That was the first hand up there. Young, come forward, one and two, and anyone from here? Yes, and you, young, and there. I'm sorry, just for later on, by the way, you will all be able to, this is just for now. Now, dear children, please come forward. Please come forward. These, these, thank you very much. Please come forward, dear children. I'm in a bit of a hurry, so let's get cracking. More liquid nitrogen, thank you very much. Now, please listen carefully, dear children. These, these instruments here, they come from the Highgate School Physics Department, you see. And I said, can I, they're very beautiful. They're called spectroscopes, okay, direct vision spectroscopes. And what they do is they analyze the light that you're looking at. So what I want you to do, and you see that one's white, and that one is orange, would you agree with me? If you look through this, you see, that then you, I want you to tell me what you can see when you look at that light and when you look at that light, okay? Have one each, and then look through the where you see the lens there, look through that end, and you can go up close and look at the light, see, is it just orange, or what can you see? And then look at that one over there, and tell me what can you see, children? Different colors of the rainbow, well done. Now, how do those colors appear? Are they all together like a rainbow which is drawn there, or are they in a different way? Well, how do those colors appear? Look at it through that way, my dear one, okay? Look at it through there. Now, how do those colors of the rainbow appear? Are they all just like a rainbow, or is there something else about them? They're in a straight lines. In, in a, yeah, but are they, are they just like that? Do the lines merge in? Ah, 
They are separated into lines of different. Did you not see that, children? Well done. What's your name? Matt. Matt. Matt, that was a very good answer. Children, did you see they're separated into different colors? That's the stroke of genius. Thank you, Matt. Can you all just return to your seats, children? And thank you very much for your kind observations. Now, dear, my dear children, you see, please can we have the next slide? What they were actually looking at, sodium, they saw those separated lines there, and mercury, those lines there. Now, that's what we call the spectrum. You see, when we see a rainbow, we see all the colors merged into one another. But it was the German physicist Fraunhofer who in 1806 noted through accurate experiments that actually there are black lines, lines are visible. And these lines which you see here are characteristic. Every different element in the whole periodic table can give you a spectrum. We call this a spectrum. And you notice neon, helium, and hydrogen above there. And this, in fact, this type of uh, phenomenon of splitting of the color into different lines was first observed by Isaac Newton. He used the prism and he got exactly as a rainbow, which is drawn here. But in later on, when Fraunhofer noted the black lines, and then two brilliant German chemists, um, one was called uh, Gustav Kirchhoff and the other Robert Bunsen. Can we turn the lights off now, please? Thank you very much indeed. Um, those two chemists, Bunsen and Kirchhoff, in 1859, they realized that these spectra were characteristic of one element only. Every metal or every element seemed to generate a unique spectrum. And if we look at the next slide, please, there you see a periodic table, but with all all the spectra of all the elements. And for many years, this technique of spectroscopy was used to identify elements simply by looking at the lines. So today, astrophysicists use this to identify the composition of distant stars and planets, etc. And now I wanted to show you, Andres will show you very briefly. In this container here, we have a dilute solution of copper chloride in methanol. Now, Copper is the element here. Copper is the, in the blue compounds. Please watch carefully. Could we have the lights dimmed for this? And Andres will now show that when you spray this into a flame, it's got alcohol, which it will heat up. It will heat up the copper in there. And notice the wonderful flame color which you get. Please observe. Yes, more, more, there we are. Thank you, Andres, brilliant. And there you see, now, this you see, thank you very much. And what I wanted to say is, this you see, it's when you observe fireworks, dear children, you are observing exactly the same effect. The different star colors are caused by different metals present and in the firework compositions, and it is these metals that give us the, uh, that give us the in independent colors. So if you have red stars, yellow stars, blue, green, etc., they are all caused by different metals, for instance, strontium, barium, copper, and so on and so forth. Now, I have now, therefore, shown you some examples of physical states, gas, solid, liquid. I am now going to move on to another very interesting phenomena about metals and the way they form compounds. And the way they form compounds... Oh, by the way, we've got one more experiment to do before with gaseous sodium. And please excuse me, dear children, I've just remembered we've omitted a most important experiment, and this is about sodium. You see the sodium lamp there had a beautiful orange flame. I'm now going to put on my safety... Please excuse me. This experiment does require serious safety glasses, so if you don't mind, I've got mine down here. And... What I wanted to tell you is this, is the, the metal sodium. Sodium, you see, is a metal which is quite, quite different from all of the other elements, that, the other metals that we've met, or, or, or different from a whole bunch of them. Can we have the next periodic table? Uh, the, the, no, let's not do that one just yet. Let's just leave it. Let, ah, this is the one. Brilliant, brilliant. Dear children, this periodic table shows you a little bit more subtlety in the way that elements are divided. You see, all those yellow ones, they're basic, they're called transition elements. They're the ones with all the colors and all the rest of that. But you'll see the ones on the left-hand side with orange, they're called alkali metals, and sodium 
top left-hand corner, Na from the natrium Latin, sodium is an element which is very reactive. And they're called alkali metals because they form alkaline reactions with water. And what we're going to do now with um, Andres, we're going to drop a piece of sodium. Now, have we got some tissue? To, yes, I've got a piece of tissue. Thank you very much. Let me tell you what we've got, children. This is very important that you should understand. And I must also forewarn you that there might be a bang in this experiment. It's not a very loud bang, and there might also be some sparks. It might be like a bit of a firework. You certainly don't make fireworks by using a metal with water. But this may turn out to be so, and we will ask in a second or two to have the lights to turned off. Let me just show you what we've got. We've got water in here, and we've got, actually, we've added a secret ingredient to the water, and I want you to observe what happens. Now, when the, in, when the, to observe the color of the water as the sodium starts to react. Now, sodium will fizz. When we, we've got two, a small piece each, the sodium will fizz, and then there may be a bang, and there may be some sparks. So I'm just warning you, if you're afraid of the bang, you should certainly put your ears, your hands over your ears very carefully. But as I say, this is not um, that loud. Are we ready to go then? And we put one in each because we'd sometimes nothing happens. So yes, thank you very much. Now, please what, notice the color that the water has changed to. And we can dim the lights a little more. Thank you very much indeed. Please watch carefully as the sodium is fizzing away. There is definitely something going on. Or maybe it'll just stop fizzing. We can't predict. They're rather unpredictable. But there you see, we saw a little bit of a bang. And that was the reaction. Thank you very much. And so now, is that OK? Ah, another bit. There we are. Oh, there's still some more. Hang around. Let me get my goggles back on. It's still. And have you noticed once? To... Ah! Thank you, Andres. Andres warned me. I thought it had finished, you see. Now, these reactions, you see. These... Is there another one? No. No. Has it reached the ceiling? Oh, yes. Smoke rings. Fantastic. We're so lucky. Now, dear children, what's happened is this, you see. Look, see these colors? This, is, this was the indicator we had put in phenolphthalein, which turns from colorless to pink when it, uh, it made alkaline. And this is the indicator thymolphthalein. So these indicators have shown us that these are alkalis. Alkalis are the opposites of acids. Now, can we go just back to show the equation? Thank you very mu much indeed. Sodium plus water makes sodium hydroxide, and the gas was hydrogen. And that's why we got the explosion. The hydrogen was mixed in with air in the tube. I specially designed these, you see, to get this mixture. And that white smoke Smoke, by the way, is most unpleasant. It's sodium oxide. That is a very, very um, powerful irritant. Fortunately, there's only a tiny amount. And you notice we used very tiny amounts of um, sodium for it. We now come on to another type of um, property of metals. Could we just have... Yeah, the lights are bright enough, OK. Um, and this property of metals concerns the way they form chemical compounds. The vast majority of metals, all metals, form compounds which, oh, before that, let's do the mercury hammer. Sorry, I've just, now, for the mercury hammer, I've got to now, we'll go back to the compound. This won't, hopefully, the hammer's been made by now. Of course, it's been bubbling away brilliantly there. And let's have a quick look and see how this hammer now will behave if we try and use it for a purpose. So, um, I'm just putting on my gloves. These, of course, are gloves for cryogenic liquids. They're specially made. They've got this frost mark. They've got a snowflake symbol because they, of course, are designed designed for withstanding very low temperatures. So if I now unscrew this, you see, take my stand away here, and I can lift this. I can now remove my clamp, you see. I can remove my clamp. By gum, it's cold. But I can't feel it. And now, you see, I'm going to use a special device called a sliding hammer, because I've got to take my mold off. So to take the mold off, we screw in the sliding hammer like this, you see. And it's made in two halves. And then we whack it one up like this. And when we whack it one, you see the mold has come off and we have solid mercury. You sort of think, what's happened to the mercury? Well, I'm holding it in my hand and it has indeed turned to a solid. I will now remove the other one. I will now remove the other half of the mold by screwing this in here. And um, 
just like this, very, very carefully, very carefully screwing it in, you see. And again, this is a mechanical engineer's device for removing a... So give this a whack, et voila. And there you see, there is a hammer made of mercury. Would you like to hold it by the handle, my dear friend? Just see how heavy it is. Would you agree that's very heavy? Yes, thank you very much. I'm not going to pass it around because I'm in a hurry to show you before it starts melting how it can behave as a hammer. Now, I'm going to show you how it can behave as a hammer by knocking a nail into a piece of wood. Now, I did tell you that um, mercury has a very high density. I'm going to pop it back into there just to keep it cold. And I wanted to show you a comparison here. Here I have two four-inch nails. Here I have a block of wood. And here I have a conventional steel hammer. Now, the density of mercury is about twice the density of steel. It will therefore generate twice the, the momentum. If I now hammer a nail, please watch carefully, I'm going to hammer a nail with uh, this hammer into my block of wood. Please watch carefully how it happens. So I knock it in quite hard like that. But if I now take my mercury hammer, which has a much higher momentum, it can generate a greater inertia when it moves, let's see what happens, how this one acts as a hammer. And there you see it's gone right through. And that, you see, is a demonstration of how the density, a higher density of a metal can make a greater, much greater impact. If, if it might be something you, some of you might consider an invention using mercury hammers, which are far more effective than conventional hammers. Now, going back to the business of chemical bonding. Dear children, metals are always associated with electricity. And the type of chemical bonds they make are called ionic bonds. That's the thing. They make ions which are electrically charged particle. Just remember metals and electricity, that will be good enough. However, the transition elements which we showed you, can we just have the next one up? Ah, thank you so much. The yellow ones, of which copper is a member, of which iron is a member, of which there are quite a few other members, manganese, etc., they form, they're called transition. And I'll tell you why. Because they transist between metals on the left and non-metals on the right. And their properties, although they behave in the physical world like metals, etc., in the chemical world, they can make molecules. Now, this is most unusual because we're all made of molecules. We're organic. Molecules are in the air, nitrogen and oxygen. But transition metals are able to make molecules as well. Dear Andres, could I ask you, for the sake of the children, if we can maybe just... I'm going to do the experiments here. I'm just going to show the children now Thank you very much. Yeah, that's absolutely most kind, most kind indeed. I'm just going to show the children here a substance which it contains um, 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 the, the, in molecules we call the bonds between atoms covalent bonds, molecular bonds. And in ionic compounds, which have electrical properties, we call the bonds ionic bonds. So transition elements are elements which the element itself can bond either ionically or covalently. It can either make ions which conduct electricity or molecules which don't conduct electricity. And I have here... Now, the fact is, though, and this is the other important fact I wanted to tell you, is that these... When metals, transition metals, form molecules, these molecules are not very stable they tend to break down into ions. And I wanted to show an example of this happening now. Here, I have some potassium permanganate. Potassium permanganate, I'm just going to take a tiny couple of crystals with my... This is the, one of the most colorful substances in the universe. Look, you, I can't even see what I've got in there. Look, I've sprinkled a few crystals in there. Just look to see what's happened. As I now swirl it around, you will observe a beautiful lilac color. Now, that's the color you see of potassium permanganate. Now, let's concentrate on the transition metal, manganese. Manganese is combined here in a tetravalent oxyanion, MnO4 minus, you don't have to worry, but the point is it's covalently bonded. And this does not like the manganese, does, this is not a stable type of behavior for it, you see. I'm going to pour off, I'm going to pour off this solution here. 
And now, dear children, I'm going to show you how we can add a few crystals. I have here the compound iron sulfate, iron 2 sulfate. And the point about iron is it too is a transition element. If you look at element number 26, it's Fe iron. Element number 25 is Mn manganese. Now watch, this is ionically bonded. And I'm just going to literally throw a few crystals. Actually, I'll throw a tiny bit more. This one probably leads a tiny bit more. There, I'm going to throw those in and watch what happens to the color of the permanganate solution and the bonding in the MnO4 minus. As I swirl this around, you see, as I swirl around, you'll notice gradually, you'll notice the purple color start to fade. And here it's going red, you see, and very shortly, it will fade even more. I may have to add, I may have to add a tiny bit more iron to get it to fade further. Let's just decant this one here. Let's just decant this one here, and I'll add a tiny bit more iron because this one does require a bit more, and then I will show you, tell you what has happened. So I've just added another spatula measure there, and with a bit of luck, we'll even get rid of that orange. Et voila. And now you see the color has disappeared. Now, why has that happened? You see, this type of reaction is called a redox reaction. The manganese has lost its molecule covalent bonding, and it is now bonded ionically. It has a charge Mn2+. It's like an electric charge on the manganese, which has virtually no color. But what's happened to the iron, therefore? And this is the interesting bit. Iron has oxidized from Fe2+, which was pale green here, to Fe3+, which you can barely see. It's so pale yellow, you can't see it. But there is a special test for this. If I add now some potassium ferrocyanide, you will notice a beautiful deep blue color. And that is the definitive test for the iron Fe3+, you see. Et voila. And that, you see, popularly known as Prussian blue, it's an intensely strong color, and it's the definitive proof that we have gone from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. And this is an example of a redox reaction, a reduction and oxidation, which is very, very common for those metals in the middle, which are called the transition elements. And now I'm going to show you another example. Oh, let's have a bit more water. Dear Andres, thank you very much. Andres here has sprinkled some water for me here. Thank you very much. Just a bit more. Brilliant. Thank you. Can you see these filter papers, Joe? Let's just get them to, yeah, fully soaked, fully soaked. Let's just get a bit more. That's it. Absolutely. That will do. Fine. Fantastic. Now, please watch carefully. You see, I told you these bonds are not very stable. Here is some solid potassium permanganate. Here is some solid potassium permanganate. Now, once again, it's got manganese in this molecular state with covalent bonds in the permanganate iron. I'm going to now make an indentation, and I am now going to pour onto this some glycerol. That is an alcohol which is going to react with the potassium permanganate. Now, can I have the lights dimmed for this in order that the... And can you see these filter papers which are moist? I hope you can see those. We're going to look at those in just a few seconds. So please, can we have the lights dimmed? Thank you very much indeed. There we go. We're pouring on our, our glycerol, and this is an alcohol. Notice now a reaction is beginning. It's starting to smoke. The permanganate ion is now reacting vigorously. It's oxidizing the glycerol, which is propane 1,2,3 trial, and it has caused it to catch fire. This is called a spontaneous reaction, and it is an, a combustion. And now, could we have the lights on? Dear children, Please look at these fantastic patterns that we have made on our filter papers. And if you can see carefully, these are spots which are both purple and green. And this is the amazing thing. You see, the permanganate, which was purple initially, has during this reaction become green as well. And this is due to the manganate ion, which I can't remember the formula, but it contains manganese in another oxidation state. This is yet another example of a wonder. And just look at these wonderful patterns. You know, I did this experiment yesterday, and I thought, what a wonderful piece of art would this would be to photograph. So this, you see, once again, to summarize, different types of, um, different types of bonding. Dear children, 
children, crystals. Everyone loves growing crystals at school. I just wanted to show you. These are crystals which were grown by pupils at Highgate School, who I used to teach, and I very much hope some of you. Look at them, the beauty of them. But you see, I started thinking much to myself, how extraordinary that you can grow a crystal from a liquid in which all the ions and molecules are moving around randomly. You see, in a liquid, everything is disordered. The molecules, the ions are moving around. But in a crystal, suddenly, everything becomes ordered. It takes up a beautiful shape. How does that happen? I find this a difficult question to understand. Here I have a cr crystal which was grown by one of my pupils about 25 years ago. His name is Terence. And here it is. I'm pulling it out now. Et voila. And there it is, you see. Now, Terence grew this crystal. We called him Cambridge Terence. He was incredibly clever. And he went to Cambridge and he grew this crystal and I finished it off a little bit. But do you know why these children were all doing, growing these crystals? Because I challenged them. I said, can any of you make a crystal like the one which I grew? You see, this is a crystal which I grew when I was at Latimer Upper School between 1963 and 1965. It took me five years' work. I wanted to grow it bigger, but the problem is this is too small this container. So a little bit of thought about crystals. Now, from a point of view of science, we use the word entropy. In a liquid or in a gas where everything is disorganized and randomly moving around, we say they have a high state of entropy. There's a lot of a mess everywhere. But in fact, the word gas is derived from the ancient Greek chaos, meaning a chaos all over the place. That's what the molecules do. But here, what's remarkable, they are beautifully organized. And indeed, we can have all metals have crystalline structures. And can we see the next one? You see here are crystals of pure gold. That doesn't mean that every metal you see is a crystal, but what it means is if you take, cut it in half, and then take a section, etch it, look at it under a microscope, you will always see ultimately a crystal shape. And the, the science of metallurgy examines the way that the physical properties of metals behave depending on their crystal structure. We're now coming on to another very important application of metals, and that is, where do we get metals from? And the answer is, metals come from the ground, from ores. You don't find them. We have to make them. And whenever a metal is made, a huge amount of energy is released. I am going to show you now a process. Thank you very much, dear Andres. I'm going to show you a process here in which we are going to make a small quantity of pure iron. I'm going to show this by making a mixture. This is not a process that's used industrially, but it is a process which is used um, in laboratories or by welders, etc. And I'm going to make a sample of pure iron using a reaction which is known as, once again, a redox reaction. Iron occurs naturally as, the, uh, as in a variety of ores, um, which are, which are um, for instance, iron oxide, iron sulfide. The iron oxide is called hematite or magnetite. Iron sulfide is called pyrites. Over the years, we humans have learned to understand the chemistry, how to extract the iron. And I'm going to show you now, I have here a mixture of iron oxide of iron. Now, could I ask one of the helpers, Oscar, you're going to lift the cage on with uh, Andres, okay? The two of you put the cage on. This is a special cage which I have built in order to protect us all from this remarkable reaction. Now, in this reaction, which is very strongly exothermic, a huge amount of heat energy is produced. We will make some real molten iron. And what I have in here is a mixture of aluminium powder and iron oxide. And in a nutshell, it's called, it's called a thermit reaction. And what we're going to do is we're going to set it off. So I've got the mixture in my beaker here. This is a beaker which is made of fireproof glass. It 
excuse me, its melting point is at least 900 degrees centigrade. And what I'm going to do now is you can't just set it on fire with a match. You have to use a fuse powder. So I am now going to make up a fuse powder. Just excuse me, because I must wear my safety goggles for this. This is a pyrotechnic mixture of the type that is used in fireworks. And it's a mixture of magnesium powder, which burns within. We've had that already today. We've already had magnesium today. But we're not going to use it as a pencil sharpener. We're going to use it in the form of a powder. And I'm mixing it here with potassium nitrate. Now, potassium nitrate is the main ingredient in gunpowder. If you see fireworks, you'll see huge amounts of potassium nitrate uh, being used. They, they're used in gunpowder because when the Chinese discovered or made gunpowder first, about a thousand years ago, excuse me, I'm just going to remove some of the. I'm just going to remove some of the potassium nitrate because I put it. It's not. There's nothing wrong. I just like to get my mixtures correct. So I'm just sorry removing a tiny bit there, et voila. The Chinese invented gunpowder, as we know. They weren't chemists. They were just simply, like all humans, very intelligent. But they, in the natural surroundings that they lived in, they had access to potassium nitrate, and it acts as an oxidizing agent. I am just mixing together a small amount of a fuse powder, which I shall now pop into here. And I have to warn you, children, please don't look at this directly when it, um, when it actually um, takes off, because it is a very, very bright flash. There's nothing, you won't be harmed, but it's a, it, it might make your eyes a little bit dizzy for a while. So try not to look at it directly, immediately. You'll see a bright... Now, what I'm doing, there is my a secondary fuse powder, I'm on top going to put some potassium permanganate. Now, you've already seen potassium permanganate, and I've told you quite a lot about it. That's the one that caught fire with the glycerol. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take this, this lump here is not behaving itself. I'll tell you why it came out as a lump. So I'm just going to crush it with my fingers. Et voila. There it is. And I'm going to put a bit more. Excuse me, this does take, this does take uh, a little bit of uh, care to do this properly. Um, just my glasses are steaming up, so just a quick peek there. It seems to be fine. Thank you very much, Andres. What's going to happen now is this. I am going to pour a few drops of glycerine, glycerol, propane, one, two, three, trial, the one that caught fire there. When this catches fire, are Oscar and Andres ready? When this catches fire, there will you see some smoke coming out. It doesn't always work first time. You will then see a flash, a blinding flash, and then you will see um, a continued reaction in which pure iron will be made at a very, very high temperature. And look to see what happens to the beaker. So I'm going to pour a few drops on. There we are. Now, could you carefully, no hurry, no hurry, by the way. There's, this is going to, um, that's it. And now please stand back. Now, please stand back. Now, once it's finished, I'll ask you both to take it off again. Is that okay? So, we look at it. We can dim the lights for this, by the way. We can dim the lights for this. Thank you very much indeed. And now, we can observe. It hopefully will start steaming in a little minute and then catch fire. This, by the way, can take up to a minute or so. Sometimes we can add a drop of water, which acts as a catalyst. But in this particular case, we're going to leave it for a while, and hopefully it will take place without the water being added. Now, while we're waiting for this to go, ah, there it is. Now, watch. Don't look at it immediately. And now... And now watch, it's now reacting, you see. And what we've got now, inside our special container, there is a bright glow. There is a bright glow. There is a smoke which is being uh, released here. That's a smoke of aluminium oxide. And inside, very shortly, I shall demonstrate for you a piece of pure iron which has been made. Now, let's just wait for it to calm down a tiny little bit, a tiny little bit, uh, Oscar and uh, Andres, and then we'll take the top off. Now, when we take the top off, the main thing I have to tell you is this smoke is relatively harmless. So, Oscar, can we, can we take off? And lights can be on now. Then, Oscar, and to, where are you going to take it? Do you know we're taking it? Okay, Oscar, are you ready? And now, just gently, that's it. And now you see in here, 
Can you see? Here you see that is molten iron at the bottom. The glass has cracked and melted, and you'll be able to have a look at this later on. You see um, in the in the, uh, the afterwards. So you can see that it has totally. I've actually made a hole in the beaker there. The whole thing has melted away due to the very high temperature. We call such reactions exothermic, a massive amount of energy. We're now coming on to the final topic, which is transition elements in catalysis. A catalyst is a substance present in small quantities which alters the speed of a chemical reaction, but which remains chemically unchanged at the end of the reaction. In a nutshell, catalysts are used in industry because they save a huge amount of energy. The, you don't have to heat up reactions to such a high temperature as necessary, and it takes place at a much lower temperature. And what Andres is setting up for you here is the catalytic oxidation of methanol. Now, this is a very beautiful reaction. This is a very beautiful reaction. And methanol is an alcohol, and this is an industrial process which is used. It's used in industry. He's warming up the alcohol. Now, methanol is very, very flammable, and yet you see Andres is heating it with an open flame. Now, you may say, oh, that's very dangerous. Well, the answer is, you see, with a skilled operator, Andres knows exactly how much to heat it, because if the vapor were to catch fire, in the very worst instance, all he would get is a flame out of the end of the flask. But with his experience, he will know when to stop heating. Now, why is he heating it? Because when you heat up a liquid, the vapor escapes. So the liquid turns to a vapor, it evaporates. So we have a high concentration of methanol vapor, which is now surrounding, coming out of the flask. Now, and shall I turn it off, Andres? Or? Oh, you need to heat the flask. Now, this is the clever bit. Andres has, on the end of a little wire there, that's just a dividing, a dividing, a partition from the two sides of the flask. On the end of the wire, there is a tiny piece of platinum. Dear children, platinum is one of the most expensive elements in the universe, as I'm sure you know. And platinum is being, it's used in, as a catalyst in many, many applications. Um, uh, and he's now dipping it in. He's now dipping it in, and we will wait, hopefully, uh, we will observe a reaction. Can we dim the lights a little. We'll hopefully we'll see. We're looking for the catalyst to start glowing. Sometimes you need to heat it a second time, but I will keep, uh, we will keep hoping that it will gradually, you're gonna have to heat it again, well, Andres, what will that do? We'll wait, he's gonna give it another. Th Sometimes you have to heat it a se uh, okay? We have to, it's gotta go in pretty hot to get the reaction. Now what's happened is, what's going to happen is, the, should I bring the flask? No, got to be careful, otherwise you'll set the flask on fire. So we'll just wait. I, I know that Andres does this all the time uh, with a great deal of... Now, ah, that's it. It's working. Now, now, can you see it's glowing there? That platinum is glowing, but itself it's not reacting at all. But what it's doing, it's making the methanol vapor in there react on its surface with the oxygen of the air. And that reaction gives out a lot of heat energy. It's an exothermic reaction. It's an oxidation, and very shortly you'll hear some muffled explosions as the methanol vapor catches fire. And this reaction will be perpetuated for several minutes now uh, with a little dull thuds. And now, please carry on watching this. Um, Andres, do we have the balloons? I'm now going to show for the very final experiments which we're approaching is another... Now, this will shortly explode, by the way, so we have here. So just carry on watching it. And I'm going to show you the, an example of the use of catalysis in um, making a reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. Now, I think that one there... And this will continue, by the way. It's the most magnificent reaction. It will carry on going in a cycle for quite a long time, hopefully. Now, have we got the stick? Now, dear children, first of all, I have in this balloon here the lightest gas in the universe. The lightest gas in the universe, as you all know, is hydrogen. I'm going to set it on fire. It will burn in air. It will not make a particularly loud sound, and it will just make a dull thud. But, and the reason why it will burn is because 
I am applying a fire to it. I'm applying a lot of heat energy. And that, you see, is made, and that will make it react. So please watch carefully while you'll observe a bright orange flame and a dull thud. That will continue, hopefully, to go for quite a few minutes. So this is no catalyst, just simply heat causing a chemical reaction to take place. And there it is. That's nothing special. And now, and now, dear children, thank you very much. And now, dear children, in this balloon, in this balloon here, we have a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Now, the oxygen will make the balloon burn much more vigorously. And the, there will be a loud bang. Now, because there's a loud bang, I'm going to ask all the children to put their hands over their ears like this, please, OK? This is for all the children. The bang is quite loud. And once again, this is the clever bit, children. Please listen. The clever bit is this, that I am making the reaction by heating it. I'm putting energy into it, energy which we call activation energy of reaction through heat. So this will make a loud bang. I have warned you, and we shall now... And when this happens, hydrogen and oxygen make water, pure water. Please watch carefully and listen. <laughs> so there it is. That was a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Now, no, that's nothing. And now, and now for the very... And now, dear children, for the very final, and now... For the very final experiment, for the very final experiment, and we've, before we bring on the final experiment, I now wanted just to bring a little bit of news to you. At the beginning of the lecture, I told you that Gaston Planté was the French chemist who invented the world's first rechargeable battery. And that has continued to be used. It is my great pleasure to tell you that this year's Nobel Prize for Chemistry has been awarded to three outstanding chemists, professors John Goodenough, Stanley Whittingham, and Akira Yoshino, who have developed the lithium-ion cell. There will be very few people in this audience who will not have such a battery on them today. And it is thanks to these people, you see, who continue, and chemists like these, who continue to help us to save energy and save resources by making rechargeable batteries. Now, this continues to go, and this is now the last experiment. For this last experiment, Anders has prepared five bottles with a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Now, these all um, are going to make a very loud bang. You're going to hear five loud bangs. So five times. And this will be the very, very last experiment of today. So may I, before I finish, thank you all very much. It's been a great honor to uh, see you all this evening. And I very much hope you've enjoyed yourselves, but above all, that you've learned something. So can we have our team of assistants now, please? Clara, Oscar, and Aiden will come along. And allow me to tell you, they're going to, it's going to be the same level of noise as that bang here. Each of these is filled with a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. But we are not going to put any light to it. There is going to be no flame. There is simply going to be a catalyst. And the catalyst we'll be using is another transition metal, palladium. Finely powdered palladium on activated charcoal, which gives it a very, very high surface area. And the experiments will work like this. There are some cotton wool buds. Everyone will get a cotton wool bud, which is dipped in the mixture of... Oh, you've done them already. Absolutely brilliant. Now, you see, this experiment doesn't always work. That's the honest truth. And that's why I've taken five people to do it today. I reckon at least five of us do it. Then there at least is a chance that it will happen in front of our own eyes. So, children, please, hands over ears. This is the way you do it. And there will be, hopefully... Five loud bangs. So, now, uh, Andres, I'm going to hand over to the field marshal because this needs someone who has done this hundreds of times before. I have never done it. And it's so important, you see, to be able to learn something. Andres, over to you.
Where, where, right. Yep. Right? I told you, they don't always work. It's, uh, we got two out of five. <laughs> ah, three! We're getting there. What do you reckon, Andres? Three out of five, is that a good result? Shall we take a bow then and call it the end? And if there's a bang during the bow, then that will be it. So thank you very, very much indeed. It's been a great privilege. Thank you very, very much indeed everyone for your kind attention this evening. Can I bring on the helpers and Andres especially. Clara, Andres, thank you very, very much. All stand here. Thank you very, very much indeed. The young Clara, thank you very much. Right up here, thank you. And a very, 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 very good evening to you all.